It's yeah. always great to come back to LA. And I am especially happy to be in Los Angeles uh, um, with Critical Resistance and the LAPD. <laughs> the LAPD that we love, not the other LAPD. Yeah. And thank you so much, Margaret, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm also really glad that I have the opportunity this evening to engage in conversation with Robin Kelly and Fred Moten and Melanie Cervantes. So I'd like to thank Jess and Mohammed and all of the um, volunteers in Critical Resistance for having put this wonderful um, celebration together this evening. Yeah. And I appreciate the work. Actually, it has not been, it was not in 1980-80 that uh, Critical Resistance was founded. Uh, it was 1998, I believe. Uh, I, although as we grow older, we tend to, <laughs> the time tends to expand and contract at the same time. But I do believe it was 1998, which would mean that critical resistance would be approximately 18 years old uh, today, uh, almost two decades. And first, uh, I'd like to say that critical resistance has made a major difference uh, with respect to charting directions for radical social movements. Um, not only movements that specifically challenge uh, over-incarceration, the prison industrial complex, but all radical movements. And I think it is um, significant that we come together this evening during Black History Month. Yeah. 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 And we are all privileged to be able to celebrate the history of the Black Freedom Movement, because that is what black history is all about. We are privileged to be able to observe Black History Month at a time when radical activists are bringing attention to the persistence of structural racism and state violence and are letting the world know that this is precisely the time to inaugurate a process that will complete the process of abolishing slavery. Now, this is also the year of the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party. the celebration, but it is also incumbent upon us to recognize how many people linked to the Black Panther Party are still in prison or in exile. And of course, uh, we have to acknowledge that Alfred, Albert Woodfox was just released yesterday after having spent after having spent over four decades in solitary confinement. Yeah. And uh, when the brother was performing with uh, the LA Poverty Department, uh, I, I thought about uh, Albert. I thought about Albert uh, Woodfox, and I thought about the fact that Herman Wallace, uh, who had spent over four decades in, in solitary confinement, was released only three days before he passed away. I'm thinking about Asata Shakur. And I'm also thinking about Mondo Weilanga and Ed Rice and Romaine Fitzgerald and so many others. There's so many other political prisoners, but we cannot fail to mention Oscar Lopez Rivera. And we certainly can't fail to mention 
Leonard Peltier, <laughs> whose name, along with the name of Mumia Abu-Jamal, is known all over the world. And I uh, want to acknowledge that my co-defendant, uh, Rochelle McGee, has spent more than a half century behind bars and is still in prison. But let's talk about the, 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 the cause for celebration uh, as we observe Black History Month. Many new movements and organizations have arisen over the last few years. Dream Defenders in Florida, which emerged out of the resistance to the murder of Trayvon Martin, Black Lives Matter, Black Youth Project 100, and many other youth organizations across the country, including the University of Missouri students who led protests that were joined by faculty and the football team that led to the resignation of the president of the university as well as the chancellor of the entire system. And then of course, uh, those of us who are familiar with what's going on campus, uh, campuses across the country know that uh, uh, black, student, black student organizations from coast to coast mobilized in solidarity with the protest at Mizu. What is especially exciting about these new movements is that they are seriously radical. Yes. They are radical. They take seriously the importance of developing an analysis of capitalism and recognizing the attack on labor. They recognize that centrality of the resistance to over-incarceration and of developing abolitionist movements. They see racism within an intersectional framework. That is to say, anti-black racism requires an understanding of anti-indigenous, anti-Latino, anti-Asian racisms and especially now of anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia. <clears throat> In order to understand racism, other forms of repression uh, have to enter the frame. Anti-immigrant repression especially, misogyny, ableism, homophobia, transphobia. And of course, these new movements recognize that no movements for justice can be complete unless the internationalist context is acknowledged. Therefore, connections with movements in other parts of the world, and especially with the movement for justice in Palestine. Now, I know that here in Los Angeles, um, CR, as well as other organizations in the No More Jails Coalition have been involved in um, challenging the $2 billion jail construction plan. What can we do with $2 billion? And I understand, I understand that CR is especially challenging the proposed new women's jail. No jail construction in LA County. Now, one of the more, most recent victories, as Mohammed pointed out in his introduction, um, took place in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, when the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, as a result of the organizing conducted by the No More Jails uh, Coalition and CR uh, up north, um, that the Board of Supervisors refused to allocate $215 million for a new jail. 
They agreed that the city should invest this money in mental health services and, yeah. and diversion programs. Now that is a victory. I want to talk a little bit about women's uh, jails and prisons. Uh, because oftentimes when we evoke uh, the, the mass incarceration crisis, uh, uh, we assume that it's, that it's only about men. And we don't recognize that um, understanding women's incarceration helps us to better grasp the, the overall picture. Women's prisons were introduced in this country in around the 1870s uh, uh, as um, reformatories. Uh, because uh, women criminals were women criminals were considered to be um, so uh, incapable of rehabilitation. Uh, uh, men could become apparently better citizens. That's what the whole notion of penitentiary is is about and rehabilitation. But but women. Women criminals had fallen so low that there was no way that they could be picked up again. And so feminists argued that women can also be rehabilitated. Uh, but what that meant was that women could be taught within these reformatories to become better wives and mothers. Men were supposed to become better citizens. Women were supposed to become better wives and mothers. Uh, uh, and we know that prisons never succeeded in the process of rehabilitation anyway. Uh, um, but um, women, as they were relegated to the processes of being made into better wives and, and mothers, it was also a question of turning working class women, black women, women of color into better servants. Uh, so they learned how to wash and iron and sew and all kinds of domestic skills. And as a matter of fact, until the 1980s and, and the booming prison economy that was associated with deindustrialization and the dismantling of the welfare state and the rise of global capitalism, women's prisons, architecture even reflected this domestic approach. Uh, and some of you uh, have uh, actually seen CIW, and you know uh, what the, 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 the original cottage system was designed to do. But now there are some 200,000 women in US prisons. This might seem to be a small number, considering that the entire prison population consists of well over two million. But during the 1970s, when many of us first began to do this work, the entire prison population in the United States of America hovered around 200,000. So there are as many women in prison today as there were women and men 40 years ago. Now, you have probably also heard the statistics. Uh, the US has 25% of the entire planet's uh, incarcerated population, but only 5% of the population at large. But there's an even more stunning statistic if you look at the fact that um, the more than 200,000 women in prison in the US constitute almost one third of the documented female prisoner population in the entire world. Uh, the US has one third of all women in prison. The countries that have the next highest prison population are China with about 84,600 and Russia with 59,000. Uh, now, Of the many contributions that feminists, 
theories and practices can make to our activist strategies. Let me, um, let me cite this one. It is often the case that the greatest and most productive insight emanates from what appears to be the smallest and most marginal problem. And so it is with women in prison whose predicament reveals dramatically the failure of the capitalist profit-driven societies to prepare for the welfare of their citizens. There's now, of course, a popular discourse on the continuing connections between over-incarceration and policing on the one hand, and the persistence of, of racism on the other. There are so, almost two and a half million people behind bars, with seven million people directly under correctional supervision. That is one in every 35 adults. Uh, and this is, of course, largely due to the role racism plays in determining who gets stopped by the police and who doesn't, who gets arrested and who goes free, who gets convicted, who gets acquitted, who gets longer sentences and who gets shorter ones. Racism is a factor from the beginning to the end of this process. And the United States of America is a prison nation. As a matter of fact, that's um, it's a phrase in our new vocabulary. Yes. And, and I suggest that instead of calling the US a democratic nation, we call it a prison nation. Uh, and some people are recognizing the problems now, uh, including the, the, the candidates. Uh, in, I cannot uh, even <laughs> begin to. <laughs> well, <laughs> if they acknowledge the problem, and many of them are acknowledging uh, that there's a crisis, uh, something we've been saying for 30 years. And so they now recognize that um, it might be important to reduce the numbers of people behind bars. Uh, uh, and what I want to suggest is that decarceration is important. This is, a, this is actually um, a key element of abolitionist strategies. But, but decarceration by itself is not going to guarantee that the use of punitive measures to solve deeply ingrained social, political, economic problems will continue. And so what we have to do is look closely at the way in which abolitionist approaches invite us to attempt to devise more effective solutions, not stopgap measures. So I want to just spend the rest of my time um, speaking a little bit about the philosophical principles of prison abolitionism uh, and the need to recognize that there is no easy fix to this crisis. There is no easy fix to the prison crisis. It's not just a number of decreasing the numbers of people, not just a question of decreasing the numbers of people in prison. Uh, so abolitionist principles urge us, number one, to recognize the long history of racism, and thus also the long history of the black movement and abolitionism. Uh, uh, as W.E.B. Du Bois pointed out slavery could have only been truly abolished with the creation of economic, social, and political democracy. This is what was known as abolition democracy. Uh, there was the freedom movement, the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. In the 70s, a new call for abolition emerged, prison abolition as an important step in the direction of the abolition of racism. And we might also say racial capitalism. 
And of course, the Attica Rebellion was a defining moment. Uh, uh, the killing of George Jackson. And at the turn of the century, critical resistance called for a new abolitionism, a thoroughgoing challenge to what we called the prison industrial complex. We saw the deep interconnections between racial capitalism, emergent neoliberalism, and the globalization of carceral technology as a method of systematically ignoring the production of poverty, racism, and injustice associated with global capitalism. And thus, abolitionist philosophical principles urge us to develop analytical frameworks and practical strategies that do not isolate policing and prisons from the larger network of social and economic problems. In other words, it is not possible to solve the problems of racist policing and over-incarceration structurally driven by racism without taking into account the way the structures of racism are related to gender violence and heteropatriarchy and have led to the deterioration of education, the unavailability of housing, the commodification of health care, the decline of jobs, and the attack on labor unions. And thus, and thus abolitionist approaches urge us to take seriously the insights of black feminism, of anti-racist feminism. We recognize that race is always gender, gender is always race, and further that gender cannot be restricted to its historical binary structure. And as I said before, if we focus on the condition of women, and I'll add trans prisoners, we learn a great deal more about imprisonment and about radical abolitionist approaches and what they might be. Finally, an abolitionist approach urges us to expand and ex the feminist insight that the personal is political. As we understand the circuits that link state violence and intimate violence, it is essential to develop organizing strategies that do not allow the ideologies of racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism to remain undisturbed in our interior lives. Because ideology works through all of us. It is not simply a set of assumptions and guiding ideas that lead those in power to support apparatuses of violence and suppression. Even those who are, are targeted by these ideologies are often responsible for their reproduction. As a matter of fact, we might say that the state thinks through all of us. And the notion that the state thinks through us is an insight that is taken seriously by abolition. Thus, it is not only a question of challenging those external phenomena that represent racist and sexist structures of violence, but rather the ideas and emotions that we exhibit, which are responsible for the reproduction of these structures. And so finally, let me say that um, whenever we reflect seriously on prisons, we should begin with the insight that prisons have not always been among us and that they can be abolished in the future. <laughs> Likewise, there have not always been armed forces patrolling and policing human communities. We can discover new more effective solutions to the problem of security than armed human beings. <laughs>
And so it is from this abolitionist vantage point that we judge the solutions offered by those who are troubled by the resources that are being devoured by the process of mass incarceration. We cannot simply call for reform of the police in the same way that we cannot simply call for the reform of jails and prisons. We cannot simply settle for the end of mass incarceration. We want an end to incarceration, period. Yeah. We, we cannot say that we want to reserve prisons and the death penalty for the worst of the worst. We want to, we cannot say that those who have committed horrible acts of violence deserve to be in prison. Because we want to understand why this happens. And we want people who commit horrible acts to be brought into programs that help us figure out how to banish the possibility of such harm from our communities. Because when they are sentenced to prison, we forget about them. We forget about their problems. And we want to envision new forms of justice, justice that is not retributive, justice that does not reproduce harm and violence, but justice that helps us build a more compassionate, less violent society. We want an end to policing as we know it. We want an end to incarceration as we know it. We want a world that has no need to rely on policing and imprisonment, a world with free education and free health care and mental health care and affordable housing, a world whose guiding principles are socialist, a world that values black lives, and thus also all lives. Thank you.